This podcast was made possible by the kind support of Alvine Capital Management, a London-based specialist investment advisor and placement boutique. Our next guest is both a storyteller and a scribe for our industry. Hear how, from the helm of Kaya, he is capturing the culture wars, the power struggles, and the building blocks of our times. I'm Ethan Devitt, and welcome to the 50 Faces podcast a podcast committed to revealing the richness and diversity of the world of investment by focusing on its people and their stories. I'm joined today by John Bowman, who is Executive Vice President of the Kaya Association and a prolific writer and commentator on the investment management industry. He has written about the subject of culture, restoring the virtuous reputation of the industry, and ensuring that dialogue and education are maximized, particularly in the area of alternative investing. Welcome, John. Thanks for joining me today. A pleasure to be here, Yifin. Thanks so much for inviting me. Well, let's start with your background and how this quite high-level role in the investment industry kind of ended up in your future. Where did it start and did it take any surprising turns along the way? Well, yeah, I mean, life is always a series of very strange turns and twists, isn't it? Yeah, I like to say I'm a man without a country. So when people ask me, where am I from? I always stumble with that. So I I mean, in in very brief terms, spent the first seven years in Maryland, and then my wonder years were in Seattle, uh, a little bit outside Seattle, and then moved back to the East Coast and kind of bounced around a little bit, professional life in Boston, London, and now Salt Lake. So all that to say is it's been a whirlwind, and I love experiencing other cultures and people and perspectives, and that, as as anyone will tell you, that's well-traveled and has benefit of meeting lots of interesting people, it does shape you and you become kind of a a Frankenstein of those experiences, if you will, in a very good way. My dad, to specifically to your question, my dad was in the business. He was at Frank Russell, which is why we were out in Seattle at an early stage. He came back to the East Coast, as I mentioned, because he ran a Dutch asset management firm in Delaware. And so I was around it. Apparently, show and tell in fifth grade, I explained that my dad made money for a living, which I think the teacher thought he was printing counterfeit dollars in the basement. So there there was always kind of a top of mind understanding of generally what he was doing. So it was familiar to me, but I would say, Ethan, I I still don't know what I want to do when I grow up in the greatest of maybe ironies and embarrassment. I, I wanted to be a journalist in high school and in college. And in the last 10 years, I kind of am looking forward to a final chapter as as kind of a pastor. So I, this is an experience that I've loved, but it, I would be lying if I said it was a massive engineered plan that uh, has led me to where I am. It's interesting, despite having now interviewed over 130 investment professionals, I very rarely come across one whose parents were actually in the investment management industry, maybe in finance or in banking. But I guess that indicates just uh, maybe how, uh, how narrow the industry is relative to the, the rest of the professions out there. So often it's first generation investors I'm speaking with. So moving now to those topics on your mind at the helm of Kaya, what are you focused on most right now and what excites you? Yeah, well, there's a couple of major themes of disruption that we're paying very close attention to, wrestling with our board about trying to strategize on. The first one, and you may know this because we recently released a seminal piece two weeks ago at Alts LA, which we were talking about. Few moments ago, and this this is a marquee event uh, that happened obviously in Los Angeles, uh, what I think is the best investment conference of the year. And the reason we released this is that there's a very, we feel there's a very urgent and timely message that the future of the industry is at a real inflection point and will look very different than what it has over the last 40 years. And, you know, if you think about the tailwinds that have led to this unprecedented in some cases, four-decade bull market in both public fixed income and public equities, it's been the complete absence of interest rates, at least at the real level across the developed world, lack of inflation until kind of that, that bugaboo <laughs> seemed to have risen from its hibernation in the fall, and just unprecedented levels of coordinated global central bank uh, liquidity and propping up of, of asset prices and financial assets and securities. So all that has led to a really nice experience and environment. But what we have said in this paper is that that's not normal. 
Uh, usually it's much more difficult, frankly, to get to the 7 to 8% actuarial rate or wealth management return goal, depending on the type of client that you're serving. And so this is going to require a much more what we call enterprise and a creative fiduciary that's uh, going back to basics in many ways of focusing on a much broader diversification away from kind of a traditional 60-40 that has served us well in retrospect, but it, I think alpha and selection of assets and asset allocation is going to be much more important again as it was uh, in the 60s and 70s. And certainly that's an area where Kaya believes we have a really good story to tell because we're all about serving the allocator, helping investor professionals think like an allocator across the full spectrum of risk premia. So that's one. But then just briefly uh, related to that, as a result of this elusive sense of achieving investment outcomes that I think is haunting all of our future dreams is the democratization and access to a much greater part of the populace for uh, what we've traditionally called alternatives. Now, some of these alternatives are far from alternative anymore, things like private equity and venture and infrastructure. I mean, these are fairly well understood and conventional in most institutional portfolios, but really haven't had regulatory allowance in the populace. In the, and it's just simply not financially, politically, I think, savvy or allowable that a big and larger portion of the population doesn't have access to the full set tool set in order to achieve their retirement goals. So we are very much behind democratization, but the big but, as I'll end here, is that that has to come with a coordinated requisite level of education and knowledge and care ensuring that it's right for their portfolio. A lot of issues you certainly raised there. And we've, we've touched on many of them across other podcasts in the series. But what I think you have a particularly strong insight into is culture. And you've written about this. And I think all of the other issues you mentioned, whether it be active versus passive debate or the democratization of alternatives, a lot of it affects and comes down to culture. So what are your thoughts on some of the issues of investment company culture today? And how has COVID affected this? Yeah, it's a great question. It's one, as you said, I'm passionate about. It was actually the fifth of the five marks in that Portfolio for the Future paper that we termed a bit broader as operational alpha, but with culture kind of leading the headlines of what I would call the greatest secret in sustainable long-term performance. And that is having a healthy culture that really thrives and feeds and perpetuates strong decision-making and ultimately a anchor to the client goals that will serve all the actors along that value chain well. So I'm a, I'm a huge believer in culture. I, I would say the first time I heard about culture, and this is a bit of a an exposure of some of the work our industry needs to do, is after I left the industry. So it wasn't until I started at the professional bodies that I've worked for, CFA and now Kaya, that I even understood what culture was and certainly the how to wield it in an effective way. But uh, look, we, we work for a profession and that's different from other industries or trades. And I think that's a critical starting point when you talk about culture is that, you know, a profession is a collective that, as I like to say, serves a higher purpose. And as a result, it has a societal license to operate, meaning the, the, the public square understands that and appreciates that you have a certain expertise that you have their best interests in mind, and they give you a moat of autonomy. There's regulatory liberty to work in return for that trust in that societal license. And I think we work, as it comes to, to culture, we work in what I would call more of a dislocated uh, industry right now. It's not yet a profession, meaning that the benefits are still accruing a little bit disproportionately to the professionals, to us versus the end clients. And so there's a lot of work to do on asymmetric uh, fee structure and more transparency and better performance presentation, especially in the, the private capital world that we focus on. A lot of the financial engineering that gets into to piracy and trickery, and it, it just needs some work in order to become a true profession. And what I'm not saying, Ethan, is that, that this should be charity or philanthropy. I mean, we'll, members and professionals should do well, and there should be no embarrassment or be bashful about earning a good compensation if you're doing it for a good reason. You know, there's not going to be any innovation or incentive if members and professionals aren't fulfilled through doing this, both monetary and purpose-wise. So I say all that from a professional basis because that has to be the undergirding foundation of everything that flows into culture. And if you agree with that, 
that our role is kind of this stewarding of dignity of a retirement goal of a pool of capital that's serving a greater purpose like an, a university endowment or paying pensioners that have served the public uh, their public duty then that culture needs to be rooted a, a fiduciary mindset as we like to say needs to kind of flow through the dna of our recruiting our communication our our business model our values the way we benchmark our portfolios what does success look like and I think we've still got a lot of work to do there. So culture to me is just so intertwined with the why do we exist question. And I think we have we've been catching up for 100 years, right? JP Morgan had a, had a private fund back 100 years. They kind of built the merchant bank model. The first mutual fund is almost 100 years old. And ever since then, we've been trying to put up the scaffolding of what the profession should be. And this catch up hasn't quite calibrated yet. And so that's one of my big career goals and certainly why I have occupy the seats in the organizations I've I've worked for. And one of the traditional divides in investment management culture is between, say, investment-led firms and sales or business development-led firms. Do you think that divide still holds? Probably. I mean, I, I'm seeing improvement, certainly. And I, you know, when I when we talk to business development folks in our community, in our circle, uh, when we talk to client service folks, this is what I mean by alignment. You know, admittedly, the compensation structure is still one where they're rewarded and their outcomes are a function of transaction, right? And in the end, I think, as I mentioned a moment ago, if you can unify and align what success looks like for the client, if you start there and everything flows backward from that, what, regardless of what job description you hold as far as selling a mandate, managing a portfolio, even working in general counsel or compliance, I think that stuff will take care of itself. And there are great examples of uh, organizations that have that have built this. MFS comes to mind, the Man Group comes to mind that really pride themselves on a collective mantra of putting the client first. Uh, and that's more than lip service on the wall. It really has to affect your goals and your compensation and your career success. And so I, I still think there's work to do, but I have seen improvement. And I want to also ask you about the issue of innovation, as often that is tied to the concept of psychological safety, where an employer e might feel um, safe with the colleagues to take risks, to perhaps um, to try out new ideas without the fear of recrimination or equally a fear of having to admit a failure or making a mistake. And you mentioned our industry is 100 years old, but I still get the sense that there is still some problem with admitting mistakes freely, moving on and seeing them as learning experiences. Do you, and does any of that resonate with you? Well, it does. You know, I think it's a little bit unfair, the old adage of, you know, the last great innovation was the ATM in our business. That That's going a little bit too far. But I do think you raise a good point. In fact, we we're just talking about this in LA with a, a closed door group of allocators. And the question that the debate centered around how do you create an innovative culture that, like you said, really embraces risk-taking and improvement and evolution? In the greatest of ironies, one part of the dialogue started discussing whether efficiency and innovation are actually at odds with each other. So there are amazing asset owners, and they were represented in the room. You know, we think of the the models, uh, you know, the Yale, the the Canadian model, the certainly the Australian super model, right? These are extremely efficient models, but are they innovative? Do the boards from the top down allow room and liberty and, and degrees of freedom to really try new things? And I would argue that in most of these investment boards, they don't. They're programmed to look at a certain few metrics. And if they're not meeting that, then they're moving on. And kind of the rinse and repeat starts again. And I think that this is fairly endemic, particularly in the public plans, where the use of technology, introducing different networks for sourcing deals, diversifying into idiosyncratic asset classes, these take way too long. And therefore, alpha you know, ultimately disappears and is extinguished. And, and smaller endowments, family offices, on the other hand, are able to operate with much more. And this is a cultural thing. I think we it feels like, is it small versus large? Is it bureaucratic versus not? But really, it comes down to the culture and the governance that you build from the top. And how does that flow down to the everyday decision making? So I do think this is the next great bastion of opportunity for asset owner success. We'll start with board culture and particularly their adoption of innovation. 
So interesting. Well, we have so many issues to cover that, forgive me, this may seem like it's a lightning round because we're going to cycle <laughs> through a few different issues, but it certainly is not intended to, to put you on the spot like that. But let's go through a few of the, the major themes that are rising to the top when we think about the evolution of the investment management industry. And um, one of the first is the thirst for more education and more credentials. And of course, Kaya is a, is a credential. And um, do you see that some of that is changing or is it perhaps a race to gain even more investment professionals becoming more selective? How do you see that evolving? I think it was yes to many of those prefaced questions, Ethan. I mean, I, I think certainly COVID, as we've said in every industry, it accelerated disruption maybe that was coming across 10 years into a two-year, very painful in some ways, but there are silver linings for some industries and the way we've been able to skip generations literally and kind of take quantum jumps in the rate of adoption and uh, competitive kind of set of business models. Uh, and credentialing and education is no different. I think we're probably one of the least innovative industries. Not much has changed in the 30 or 40 years since professional designations really became effective and kind of a default to operate in our industry. Not a license, but certainly a default for credibility. But I think, look, we're in a bull market. We've got a very tight labor experience. Uh, capital markets have been going out for a very long time. It's hard to argue you need to reinvent yourself and get smarter and make yourself stand out when things feel very easy. But I will say there will be a reckoning. Obviously, we're seeing some cracks in the armor. I mentioned inflation and the market's turning over a little bit. But how education is delivered, how technology disrupts it, how the content needs to evolve... No one can rest on their laurels, not even us large few that have been uh, blessed enough to be in kind of a pole position for several years. Um, we've got a lot of worry on our hands. And like I like to say, you know, any good leader is a little bit paranoid, reinventing themselves constantly before someone else does it. So we're watching closely and I, we won't be, we certainly won't escape this. Okay, next topic is ESG integration at both at the, the allocator level as they're looking, maybe setting net zero targets and then the investment manager level as they are integrating it across their entire investment process. How do you see that evolving? And maybe you can also touch on products specifically focused, say, on sustainability. You know, it's funny when you first were kind of have to ask me on this, I would have given a much different answer on this pre the unfortunate situation that's going on in Ukraine, because it has had an effect, I think, on the mindset and the pace of much of the transition away from fossil fuels. So let me answer the question first. We take it very seriously. We believe particularly on the climate side and the diversity side, these are critical and very material elements that should be integrated within any financial analysis of any asset or manager or fund that some of them might be pre-financial, uh, but they will eventually be financial and make their way through the financial statements one way or another. Could be a stranded asset on the balance sheet. It could uh, in the case of oil wells, or it could be more of an ROE accelerator in the case of really strong diversity at the board. So they're all very different. There's a bit of a potpourri and you have to be thoughtful about not approaching this as a one size fits all, you know, 50 some factors. And, you know, if you're good at 35, well, suddenly that's a good ESG strategy because they're all very different. And this has become a monstrous kind of catch all. Um, we've added some readings at level two to make sure that we equip private capital portfolio managers and professionals to integrate this. Uh, we did a very large study with KPMG that looked at the progress at the asset owner level. But I think, as I alluded to a moment ago, there has been a bit of a dilemma as we've moved very quickly because of the, the lobbying effort of much of the voices we would agree with. We have uh, created a very delicate supply chain situation that we're, we in the US and in other parts of the world are feeling at the pump very intimately and acutely. And I think we have to be thoughtful about balancing what is going to be a long-term move with the realities of the economics and the a GDP that is globally addicted right now to fossil fuel. So it's, it's going to take more than just flipping a switch. We've got to be careful not to buy into these divest now approaches that simply put the decision into the hands of someone that cares less. I think we could be thoughtful and slow in doing this and create the right incentives and tax breaks from the sovereign. So, so much to say there, Ethan, but I will, I'll stop there because this is meant to be lightning. <laughs> exactly. Well, let's continue though on that topic, um, diversity in the industry. We touched earlier on culture and obviously uh, diversity and inclusion really contributes to culture and the kind of culture that 
will encourage employees to stay as opposed to participate in the great resignation. How have you seen the diversity of the industry evolve over the course of your career? And what score would you give it today? Well, I, it's been embarrassing if I'm completely honest. And I'm so glad that as a girl dad, especially, this is very personal to me. So on the gender side in particular, I've been passionate for a long time. And the numbers are still, while they've improved, they're still not acceptable. I think the latest numbers I've seen across the entire industry are kind of low 20s, 20% low 20s are women. The What we've traditionally called alternatives is much lower than that, kind of in the low teens. And sadly, if you dig a little bit deeper, scratch a little bit deeper, places like venture capital, traditional private equity, hedge funds would be even lower, single digits. So there's just a ton of insular kind of recruiting, perpetuating that has to be unlocked, undone, and blown up. We can play a small part. We've stood up an executive level, global head of DEI, that because we're passionate about this and and we're starting to build partnerships, particularly at an earlier level in the life cycle of young ladies and women to kind of convince and hold their hand and encourage them through the pathways and sometimes ceilings and impediments that women often face, both in reality and perception. We're working hard, but we can only do so much. And, and I'm, but I am, I, the one side, the other side of that coin is that I'm encouraged at the sheer scope of adoption and passion on this. I mean, we're past the point of debate of, yes, it's the right thing to do, but does it add to the bottom line? And it becomes kind of a moral versus a financial debate. And, and that, those discussions, thankfully, as shallow as they were, are over. This is both the right thing to do, and it clearly builds a better business and provides better investment outcomes. And so, uh, yes, I'm passionate about it. And I, I just hope in the rest of my career, we can see that, that curve turn up a little bit quicker. And I want to go back to one of the culture discussions we had, because this is something that's quite close to my heart, is around remote working. And you mentioned before that we are a professional business and apprenticeship matters. And now that hybrid working is the norm, and sometimes it's fully remote, how do you think that that affects culture? And how can we bring people in to the the firm culture when we're only together a fraction of the time? Yeah, I worry about this a lot. And I, I, I we think about it a lot, obviously, as everyone is, you know, knock on wood, as, as COVID seems to be finally, with a couple last breaths here, moving away off the coast, if you will. But what does a new normal look like? And, and look, clearly, permanently, things have changed, right? I, I don't think five days in the office, nine to five is palatable anymore to anyone, regardless of generation, regardless of business model. I do think there's a lot of degrees of freedom and a spectrum of allowable solutions, depending on what type of business you're in. In our case, as you've alluded to, in our industry, it is very much a human business. We're dealing with real live clients, right? Real humans that have real goals and real challenges and real capital need, liquidity needs. And in order to do that, we operate in a people-intensive environment that shares ideas and challenges each other. And as we just said, from a diversity standpoint, if you're not seeking those perspectives and kind of allowing for that venue of disagreement and seeing body language and tone, then I think that that's compromised. So I think we've got a lot of work to do to make sure that when we come together, it's intentional and purposeful, meaning come in Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. And then when folks come in, we're all in our offices or in conference rooms on Zoom. It's like, that's a complete waste of time. But let's optimize the time we are together to truly excavate the benefits of uh, mentorship, of uh, shoulder-to-shoulder learning, of bouncing ideas off of each other, of spontaneous kind of social relationship deepening. We work better with people that we enjoy and know and trust. That's just fact. As as humans, we're created that way. So I, I think we've got to be thoughtful about why it is we're coming together, which I think there's a great, great reason to do so, but ensuring that we create the environment and the accountability so that we're, we are spending that time together to benefit those elements of our work rather than be seen as maybe geezers that are just requiring an old model just because it feels better. Yeah, that's so interesting. And I like that point about being intentional, not letting it just be kind of haphazard how a hybrid work environment evolves. Because right. it is it is true about how our, our time gets spent and how productivity can differ. My last question of the lightning round goes back to the course that the the real raison d'etre of Kaya 
around alternatives. You mentioned why, uh, questioning why we still call private equity alternatives as it's become so embedded now in many portfolios. But I'd just like a last question about how you see the adoption of what comes under the alternatives umbrella as changing among clients and what you see kind of maybe at the margin in terms of areas of new interest. Yeah, well, and the greatest of ironies, you know, we're, we're 20 years old, guys, so we've left adolescence, I guess. And we like to joke, we have for 20 years been in the business of trying to take the all out of alternatives. And what we mean by that is not, not just a cavalier bravado adoption of some slice of the pie to juice up or provide extra octane on top of your beta portfolio, but rather that diversification across all these types of risk premia for purposes of uncorrelated cash flows is really important. And these things should not be seen as kind of the other stuff or the the extra juice or the stuff over in the corner after you kind of fill out the 60-40. And I think we get tongue-tied and a lot of the apparatus of our industry is structured around these asset class buckets that I don't think do do a good dis- do a good service to the entire industry and certainly not to clients. So that's a whole nother discussion. But what am I seeing? I think we're at 18 trillion as far as our numbers. So 18 trillion on a denominator of 153 trillion are in what we have traditionally called alternatives. That's about 12% just to do the quick math. Our members think that number probably goes to 18, 20%. A big part of it is what I described at the beginning of our discussion, which is expectations of 60, 40 public market returns going down, particularly in a real sense and needing to diversify into other areas of return. So that is that is leading this kind of gold rush towards alternatives in many forms. The other thing that's happening obviously is, is interest rates, while they've ticked up recently, they're still at historically very low levels. And so what do you do for your yield, right? The new 40, as we like to call it in the 60, 40. Uh, so private debt, infrastructure, these kind of fixed income acting like assets that are very stable, that spit off a very predictable cash flow that provide liquidity for those that have liabilities like pensions or endowments. And then maybe a little bit juicier digital assets, right? Particularly at the the high net worth and wealth management industry, there's just an explosion, probably too much passion, frankly, uh, for all kinds of digital assets and, and digital currency and DeFi access and Web3. And we think it's a fascinating space that has same power, but how to assess valuation and appropriateness and reasonable basis, of course, is still fairly elusive. A lot, a lot there. And certainly uh, it does seem that the um, product proliferation uh, in alternatives has never really uh, slowed down. So it's great, great. I'm sure the Kaya curriculum is changing all the time. Let's just move back now to some personal reflections because you've been really a, a monitor of the investment management industry for so long. You've seen plenty of investment mistakes other people's mistakes, plenty of setbacks, perhaps at a firm level. In terms of your own personal journey, have there been any setbacks or challenges that have made an impression on you and how you see the world? Yeah, lots of setbacks, certainly. I mean, I I tend to be a storyteller and maybe that came through. And as a result, I tend to be caught up in storytellers. So when I was an analyst earlier in my career, I, you know, the charisma of a leader, potential total addressable market of a new product, the consumer momentum around something exciting and fresh and shiny. I mean, these are all the red flags of bad investments, I realize as I say this out loud. But as a young analyst and portfolio manager, I really got caught up. I was following European telecom when the whole 3G infrastructure and and bidding for certain parts of Europe were, were kind of at a fever pitch. And It did quite well in that simply because of the environment. But then uh, as I started following later, a couple years later, the U.S. technology industry, very much the Web 2 firestorm. So when e-commerce was exploding and you had great stories, a whole lot of funding, particularly from the VC world coming at it, consumer interest in, in buying your groceries online, right? Which now seems fairly normal. Buying your pets, uh, supplies and food online, that feels very normal, particularly in COVID now. But the infrastructure, the supply chain just wasn't there yet 20 years ago. So I think the big lesson there is sometimes it checks all the boxes, but just its time has not yet come. And to get caught up in that without kind of grounding yourself in both the financial model, the cash burn, and the reality of the enablers, meaning the the boring infrastructure. I learned the hard way there and caught a lot of falling knives earlier in my career. So still have some scars there 
if and but I think I'd like to think that I've learned my lesson. But that was a rough time, that dot com bust, as we all know. We certainly do. <laughs> and, and in terms of any key people or mentors, have you had any of your own? Oh my. Well, I used the word Frankenstein earlier. You know, the context I often use that kind of Mary Shelley illusion is in leadership. I mean, I think every one of us, and if we're not, we're I think we're not taking advantage of the trajectory and the experiences we have. But by definition, you should be a Frankenstein of the people that you've been in contact with. Even the ones that maybe weren't great leaders. There's always nuggets that you can bring in and adapt and make your own. And so I've had so many. I mean, uh, Tony Ryan, who runs Aero Street, a hedge fund in Boston, was my first boss at State Street Global. And he taught me the idea of followership, you know, how important it was to inspire a group. You can have all the great answers, but if no one's behind you, you're not leading anybody, right? And John Rogers, one of my CEOs at CFA, taught me the how servant leadership is just a much more effective approach than command and control. Later, Paul Smith, who was my last CEO at, at CFA, taught me the benefit of a leadership team that disagrees well and respectfully and the benefit of healthy debate. And if we're all looking around nodding, then there's something wrong you should be asking. And then maybe most recently, Bill Kelly, my current CEO, I mentioned this healthy dose of paranoia that every good leader needs to have, constantly reinventing yourself before someone else does. Jack Welch used to talk about destroying your own business in six months or one of your competitors will. And so this this not overwhelming sense of paranoia, but always feeling a little bit threatened. Uh, and that's a good thing. And so all of those things I, I, I'd like to think I've absorbed into my own philosophy. And I'm sure there'll be many more along the way. And in terms of any words of wisdom that you've come across or any creed or motto that you live by, can you share anything there? You know, I was, as I alluded to at the beginning, you know, faith is important to me. So having this, what I've learned is having this kind of eternal lens on things, puts proper perspective on those momentary circumstances and setbacks and bad days where you feel like the world's crumbling and can quickly overwhelm you. And my time in Boston as I've mentioned, when I was uh, running non-U.S. equity portfolios, I was really kind of swaying in the wind, bobbling in the ways of life and market volatility. And there were four kind of friends that came around me and kind of taught me this and modeled how you can be excellent and hardworking and diligent at your job. But the motivation, the fuel behind that is very different than the paycheck or being on top of the peer rankings, right? There's a, there's a much higher purpose. And that I'm far from perfect at it, even, but I, I, um, it has stuck with me and I'm still grateful for those guys. And would that be part of the advice you have for your younger self to see the bigger picture or, or something else? Definitely. I was impetuous, rash, emotional. You know, my dad used to always say, trust your gut. And I, I get why I used to say that, you know, kind of your, your moral compass, your conscience should play a big role. But sometimes the, the heart is sometimes deceiving. And especially with a, I tend to run on emotion more than rationality sometimes in my relationships and my decision-making. That can serve me well when I'm managing people and serve me really poorly when I'm trying to make an objective decision. And so sleeping on things, talking to a mentor, taking a breath are things I learned the hard way, you know, than responding to an email right away or, or quickly trying to make a rush decision. So that at nearly 50 now, I, I think I've been a little bit more deliberate in my decision-making. Well, thank you so much, John. It's interesting. I think you enable us to put that eternal lens on our own industry. And you characterize yourself as a, being a storyteller. And I see you both as being a storyteller and a scribe who is kind of monitoring our industry and forcing us to think, step back and think, examine ourselves and maybe see how we can do better and how we can innovate and prepare for the future. So I couldn't be uh, more cheered to know that someone like yourself is helping to set the standard for the generation of the future when it comes to Kaya and other qualifications. So thanks for coming here, for being patient with my lightning round and for sharing your insights yeah. with us. It's been an absolute pleasure. And you're very kind to say that. I'm having a, a great ride. And like you said, just trying to, to play my small role in contributing to serving clients well. So excited to have had this discussion with you. And thanks for all the work that you're doing as well. And I'd encourage people to keep following some of the, your insights on LinkedIn, which is where I, I really enjoyed reading them. I'm Ethan Devitt. Thank you for listening to the 50 Faces podcast. If you liked what you heard and would like to tune in to hear more inspiring investors and their personal journeys, please subscribe on Apple Podcasts wherever you get your podcasts. You can find all of our content on the 50 Faces Hub, where you'll find a library of role models, resources, and other solutions to enhance your career. 
This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be construed as investment advice and all views are personal and should not be attributed to the organizations and affiliations of the host or any guest.